fullness, every goodness in our lives now. In the church, Lord, come revive us, O Lord. And then we owe God a very wonderful appreciation by clapping unto Him. Praise the Lord. By the special grace of God, my name is Sister Edith. I'm from Kronduma Parish. I'm here to testify the goodness of God and the healing and the deliverance upon my life. It happened like this. First week of December, I started breathing. Not that I'm pregnant, but the breathing started like that. And when the breathing continued, after our retreat, I now went to hospital. I conduct a test. The test said that it's a turret infection. After the treatment, the everything got worse. And now later, I went to my pastor, he prayed for me, and now they come back to the hospital. And the doctor sent me to scan to know the causes of the bleeding. I went to happen that the day that I went to scan is the very day that we have first night of metamorphosis. So after the scan, I went back to the doctor. And the result of the scan showed that nothing, nothing, no fine blood and no infection. The doctor now said that I should go to another test to know the cause of the bleeding. So on my way going home that day, and that day was the night vigil. I was thinking, how can I cope? Because I know that before daybreak, I know how many times I will change myself before daybreak. But I branched to one of my brother's shop and he called me to come and I came and God remember me as I came that day the first time that daddy came out to prayer he wanted to conclude the prayer and he said that that breathing must stop he said three times and said that breathing before the end of this night vigil it must stop in Jesus name when I was standing there I knew that and begin to appreciate God to remember me and when he came out for the second prayer, after general prayer, he started to mention the, the prayer points one by one. And he still mentioned that my case, that that satanic uh, beauty must stop in Jesus' name. My brethren instantly, the bleeding stopped. Before I leave my house, everything dry up. And they turn all the glory to Almighty God. Praise the Lord. I appreciate the Lord. Amen. And the doctor said, go scanning and they're turning her and turning her until she came to God. The man of God made a statement. He didn't report her case to God though. God saw it and reported it to the man of God. And he said that breathing, as if he discovered with her before, that breathing must stop this night. And before they finish the night, the breathing stopped till today. Is it not wonderful, brethren? This is wonderful. Hallelujah. Tonight, the same man of God will make a pronouncement. And something must stop your life in Jesus' name. The next is fine. Please go straight to the point and give us the testimony. Praise the Lord. Watchman, praise the Lord. Who's standing before you, Sister Hope Udekwe Chike? Praise the Lord. From Maraba Ifa in Chuku District. I'm here to give God thanks for His love and mercy upon my family. In fact, we came here for night of metamorphosis just some few months ago. According to what my husband told me as we are going home, so on night of metamorphosis we are here and the choir came up for ministration according to what he said that when the choir was ministering unto the lord and he bent down his head for prayer and he saw a key on his front he asked the spirit of the living god what means this he said toyota toyota and he claimed it According to him, he said that Toyota means car, and he claimed it. So, my brethren, 
immediately the choir finished the ministration and shift and uh, move out. That he climbed the pulpit of many colors to minister unto us. And immediately he opened his mouth and he told us I was away because I was sitting down there. Immediately he opened his mouth, he told us that the spirit, the angels of the Lord is around the, the camp. That they came down with the gift, the gift of keys. Some keys is for car, and the other ones is for houses. And I claimed the boat. And when my husband was telling me that, I believe it at all, because I know how God used to speak to him. And behold, my beloved brothers and sisters, the car is packed up there. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the man of God said, The angels are giving cars and houses. And it will look too strange. How can I get a car? Car is not a granite. He said, As we are talking now, the car is parked outside there. Brethren, is it not wonderful? <laughs> Hallelujah. That is one of the mysterious things that God has been doing here. And this night, something more mysterious will take place. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's take the next testimony, please. Go straight to the point. Praise the Lord. My name is Brother Christian Linus Anayotuku. I worship here. I want to glorify the name of the Lord for his goodness and mercies upon my life and that of my family. It happened that I have one illness in my body, but God concluded it on first of night of metamorphosis that we have in this place. That comes that sickness today is no more in my life. Amen. And God carried out environmental sanitation in his body. Everything was excavated and thrown out. Maybe you don't even know how your own is happening. Tonight, there will be excavation. There will be environmental sanitation. You will not have them anymore in Jesus' name. Amen. Next is fire. Straight to the point. Praise the Lord. Watch my praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm here to testify the healing of God upon my life. My name is Sister Oluchi Emmanuel. I'm from Suleja Parish. Praise the Lord. It happens uh, January. The beginning of the January, we started fasting and praying. Through that fasting and praying, I have severe pains in my chest. I said, no, I can't take medicine. How can, how can I be fasting? I'll be taking drugs. No, I rejected it. I continue. The pains was seriously severe. I can't control my still. The things swell up. I said, God, you will take control. I can't take any drugs. I remember that night of metamorphosis is coming, January. I said, God, as I'm coming this night of metamorphosis, I will never go with this sickness. Brethren, I claim it. Reaching here that January, the night of metamorphosis, our daddy was praying and decreed. There's many people that have infect sicknesses. Different kind of sicknesses that he sent some pastors to go and lay hand upon them. Brethren, behold, they lay hand upon me. I claim it that I receive my healing. After that night of metamorphosis, reaching in my house, Saturday, Sunday morning, I couldn't experience any person again. Help me and thank God. Praise the Lord. Brethren, I want you to help me and thank God. God has blessed me and my husband to give us a house. 
now we are a, a landlord and landlady. Praise Amen. Brethren, great things are happening. I pray you will not go empty handed. You will pick your own tonight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let's take the next testimony. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My name is Brother Gabriel Tezi from Duce Parish, the Apostle. The Acts of Apostle Parish from Duce. Praise the Lord. And I want to thank God how he has delivered me from the hands of a foster who introduced himself to me as a worker in Dunamis Church. Sometimes in January, there was a man I used to work for him for about three years. So since I've been working with him, he has been paying me money, I've been paying people, I've been doing business. I never had any problem of one naira with him. I never cheated him with one naira, neither have I misused his one naira. So, but this time I was looking for machine for him. A brother here introduced me to this very boy who was a manager to somebody who has the power to give machine to people. So I took my mind to that place. He saw the machine, he said it's good for him. But they needed some repair. So they gave me 500,000 I gave to the boy. They did some repair after three days. The man brought another 500,000 so that they can move the machine to site. So all of a sudden, when they finished that job that the first money was paid to repair the machine, the man paid me money. I paid one million naira into that man's account on the 1st of February, this 2019. So that early morning, around that car, 8 o'clock, he needed to call me and tell me, yes, I've gotten the money. Because the bank has told me that I would do one million naira from my account. So I called the man and said, have you got the alert? He said, no. He never get anything. Then the man that gave me the money began to call me. How far I paid the money? He said, but they called him from the site that the money had not been paid, that they want to withdraw the machine from there. I said, no, I've paid. He said, no. He said, I should call my man. I called the same man. He said, I've not gotten a light. The man said, I should come to his office. That very first of February, I went to his office. From that first February till about two weeks ago in this month of March, I've been like a, a handkerchief in the hands of this man because of the money. He don't know the mind that I gave the money, but he, he leaves me because I will be working with him. So if his people come in with, he's a Muslim, they will tell him and say, ah, don't you think that these people collaborated to each other? Take him to EFCC, take him to SAT, take him. He said, no, for three years I've been working with me and I've not had any, this, anything like that. Therefore, something will be wrong somewhere. So we went to the bank to confirm whether this money that the boy is saying they have not dropped, they have not dropped, whether I have dropped. We go to Zine Bank where I paid the money to. They say one million naira dropped into his account this morning. I called the man and I said, why are you telling me that I've not gotten the alert? But I was told now in the bank that one million naira dropped inside the account. From that moment I told him like that, he put my call on diversion. If I call him, he said diverted. If I call him, he said diverted. That's how we keep on around two o'clock. My man begin to tell me something. I told the man, let us even check whether it's like this man has started doing something because my mind is telling me something. We called the bank officer, he said that they have with do two hundred and fifty thousand from that money. The man now said, let them withhold that seven fifty. The bank said that they can't do it illegally, that you have to go to court. This is how we run around, went to the court, and we held that seven hundred and fifty thousand. From that, second, from that first problem, there's no way we have not tried to get the boy. Calling him every night, they say, please come and pay this. Since you have not paid this money, and then you have caused trouble and stopped to really give this money, pay this money back to my account. And what happened? The day he went to collect the money, you find out that they blocked the house. But after all said and done, then we took Sass to his house to carry his wife. 
as God will have it. That day we went there to carry his wife. There was one of his brothers that walked with the Radio Nigeria. He was coming back and he saw us there. He came in and said, What is happening? We never knew that the man done anything about it. Then the woman explained to the man, he said, Why is this thing happening? You have not told me. He short to cut the story short. At the end of the day, the man pleaded with the south and said that they should, uh, he should talk to the guy, let them give him from that Monday to Friday that he's going to do something. The, now, the man now said, okay, let us tell him by his word. We give him that Friday. On the process, he talked to the brother. His brother paid 200000 back to my account. And then we asked him to come and return the other money. As bank said that they can't do anything unless the man is around. We tried that. No, we have to go back to the court. Finally, the court gave order that they will pay that 270000 I mean, 250 to my account. As long as I was the one that I paid it. Then the bank now paid the 750000 and I back to my account. And I paid it back to the account of the man. I remember that is how I was free from the hand of this man. I want you to help me and thank this girl who had delivered me. Where would I have got one million naira to pay? Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Put your hands together for the Lord. I appreciate the Lord for the intervention of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother, you have seen how far the brother went to correct the money that is due to him. And so it is needful for us to be aware of 419 syndicates that are everywhere now. So I even go to the point of telling you that admission has begun to your son, to your daughter, this and that. Foreign admission, this, you should pay social amount, and all those things. And these things are 419 operations. They are everywhere now. So there is a need for the church to be very, very careful and alert, depending knowing who and who you are transacting with. Praise the Lord. There are also issues of scholarship. We are giving your son, your son scholarship to China, to India, to Ukraine, all those. So, so you should come and pay some amount of money, all those. And they know children they are looking for admission. They will be rejoicing at scholarship. I got a scholarship. And all those things are falsehood. They are only looking for a way to tie something and correct money from you and vanish away. The number they gave you, the moment they correct that money, the number will no longer be reachable. So this is the end of the world. With the, the knowledge has increased, knowledge of fraud has increased, knowledge of evil has also increased. And the, the wisdom of God should guide us in all those things. Praise the Lord. Now we want to take the next testimony, please, straight to the point, you can summarize it. We want to hear what God has done. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm Sister Grace, testimony delineally. I want to thank God for deliverance upon my life, and I also want to thank God for one of my daughter's success delineally. Yesterday night, we are all at our backyard after we have finished cooking. We were eating. When I was eating, I was under attack. I was seeing those spiritual things that are attacking me. But I, I did not pray. I was just singing in my mind and I was praying. And the thing was afflicting me. It was as if they poisoned my body. So when I was eating, before I know it, my daughter finished eating and she walked from where she was sitting. She started shouting, shouting that something just uh, pinched her, her legs. I said to her, maybe it is a firewood, maybe you match firewood. My husband started, he used torch and started flashing, looking, maybe it is a scorpion. So as my husband was searching, he saw a big scorpion. So, in fact, we don't know, my husband said, bring cold water, let's pour on her leg. My son said, bring onions. In fact, everybody was confused. I now stood up, I went to her, I said, let me pray for her. Nobody even cared about the prayer. And I laid my hand on her head. I told her, 
put your finger where the things sting you. And I started praying. I prayed for her. I pleaded the blood of Jesus to nullify whatsoever the scorpion had pushed in her life. And I used the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I prayed that God has given us power to trade upon scorpion and snakes. After praying for her, and I prayed for myself because I was under attack that very time. After praying for myself, I went back and started eating my food. Before I know it, I received my healing. Then before I know it, my son started saying, Mommy, you know this scorpion is a big scorpion. Why not carry this girl to the hospital? This and in fact, the noise was too much. She talked and he talked and talked. I saw yeah, that millions of naira you have. Why are you bringing? Let us take her to the hospital. I leave them there because the noise was too much. I continue with my eating. I asked my daughter, how is the pain? He said it's reducing. When we slept, we woke up this morning. He told me, Mommy, the pain is gone. I want to appreciate God who has delivered us. Praise the Lord. Amen. We appreciate the Lord for that intervention and the healing. I will give God the glory in Jesus' name. The next is fire. Quickly, straight to the point. Praise the Lord. My name is Teresa Madoako from Bagua Fellowship. I want to thank God Almighty for his favor towards me and my family and caring and protection. Brethren, it, it happened on January. I used to do vegetable farm. So on January, I and my children went to farm. Behold, the thief entered and cut my vegetable. So that day, I was so angry. The, my neighbors, they say that I should not worry. It's the same thing they do their own. They cut their own. I was angry that uh, I am not the same category with them. They caught their own, they caught my own. It's, not, it's unfair. So uh, I call my children. Two of them, I say, it, it seems that God is not answering our prayer. So I was worried that day. this happened on January. I tell the Lord that this, this is the beginning of the year. I can't take this. How can I start with sorrow? the beginning of the year. So I prayed to God. All of us, we joined and prayed. Reach on February, one of my customers that returned from abroad, he came. He gave me, he said, we are, at that day I'm not in the market, but my son called me that somebody is looking for me. I came there, the woman gave me this morning, not dollar, Ure, uh, give me your so as you give me that money Amen. Every, everything you give me is 50,000 so uh, after this night of metamorphosis last month night of metamorphosis on Friday on Saturday morning the other person sent 100,000 before you know it before this morning one pilot for Abuja here. He said, I come inside this market because of you and your children. For long, I never see you people. The pilot brought money for my children. Because he asked me this one. I said, this one has to go back to school. He said, take this money. The other man said, I was in my house. Something touched me to come and encourage you. The other one brought money. The other one sent. The other one sent. The other one said, Another one. Amen. Reach today. In, in the afternoon, somebody called me. He said, Do you see the money I sent for you? I said, No. I never see the money. What is your name? He said, My name is Chinwe. He said, He sent money so, so, so there. I said, I never see him. I said, Let me check. I see date on 25th. That's on Monday. I see credit a lot. Since that February till now, that's how money. The other one came back from abroad, a Yoruba woman with her husband. He said, I brought, I bought this thing for you. Mommy, take. It's for you. That is how God favored me. I sent my children to school. Pay their school fees. Do everything for them.
Amen. Brethren, when the favor of God comes on an individual, he will cancel labor. God will remove labor and give you favor. And you, are, you will never remain the same in Jesus' name. Want to rise up on our feet and begin to appreciate the Lord for the wonderful testimonies of the brethren.
Verses 1 and 2. Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for it is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he had redeemed from the hand of the enemy. That is an injunction by the Spirit of God unto the church, unto the people of God. It says that to give thanks unto the Lord is a proper thing. It is a recognition that the mercies of the Lord endure it forever. And it says in verse 2, let as many as have been as have been redeemed by the Lord. Let as many as have received the touch of the Lord. Let as many as have received his tender mercies. Let as many as the Lord has intervened in their matters one way or the other. They owe the Lord one thing. The Bible says, they should say so. They should not bottle it up. They are not to hold it within themselves. They are to come to the church, to the congregation, and declare what the Lord has done for them. That is the Bible, as it was in the Old Testament. That is the way it is in the New Testament. And certainly that is the way it is today. And you know that when the Lord gives an injunction, as we have been told in this church again and again, and especially this year in our Bible study as we began, we said that the standard response that the Lord expects from us whenever he gives an injunction is what? Just obey. So this is also one of those injunctions that the Lord expects us to obey. And to that extent, it should not be hard and it is not proper, and the Lord knows it, that if he has done anything for you, and of course he has, if you sit down and sit back and say you won't share any testimony, for whatever reason you used to justify your disobedience, it is disobedience because you have not obeyed this injunction. Praise the Lord. I do not need to overlabor this matter. So if you are among those the Lord has redeemed, the Lord has intervened in your case, your prayer has been answered, and you are sitting back, you are not sharing your testimony, you have not obeyed this injunction. And if you have not obeyed, it simply means you have disobeyed. And the Lord doesn't have a positive reward for those that live in disobedience. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the next window of opportunity you have to testify, go to that place. Let it be that you offered yourself to testify and perhaps for one reason or the other, the church couldn't give you an opportunity. You have discharged that your burden and the Lord will not hold you accountable. But if for whatever reason you decide to stay there, not sharing your testimony, it is a debt you owe which you must pay. Praise the Lord. Shall we bow down our heads so that we can pray together and see what again the Lord has for us in this third night of metamorphosis. Almighty God, we are grateful to you because we are a privileged people to be here. We are here in your presence because it has pleased you to bring us into your house. Your house is a place of encounter with you. 
your house is a place of fellowship with you with jesus christ with the holy spirit and with one another when we come to your house we receive your blessings and it has been told us again and again that the vehicle that delivers your blessings unto men is your word forever therefore as you speak to us today we pray you will help every one of us enlighten our understanding open our ears and our hearts to receive your word and we ask that as your word drops into our hearts it will deal with every other thing that have accumulated in the heart that have been making it difficult for us to work with you according to your standard in the name of jesus christ father when you wanted your servant jacob to inherit the blessings that you pronounced in abraham his father you asked him to return to bethel and tonight as you ask us lord to begin to return to the place where we encountered you and begin to look for those things again that you planted in our hearts and our lives to show that we had a father son father daughter relationship with you as that man obeyed that day in the old testament even jacob israel of god and god the blessings of his fathers we pray that today every one of us beginning from the person in the pulpit to those that are in the pew and as many as are here this evening this night as we hear your word we will return to Bethel, and as we return the blessings that are with us in Bethel shall be ours in jesus name Amen. dear holy spirit speak to every heart speak to every person and use this word to accomplish the purpose of god for the church for this hour in jesus name we have prayed amen, amen. please shall we open our bibles to second john second epistle of apostle john we will read verses 6 to verse 11. second john verse 6 and this is love that we walk after his commandments this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning you should walk in it for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that jesus christ is come in the flesh this is a deceiver and an antichrist look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward whosoever transgressed and abided not in the doctrine of christ had not god he that abided in the doctrine of christ he had both the father and the son if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine receive him not into your house neither bid him god's speed for he that biddeth him god's speed is partaker of his evil deeds praise the lord look at verse six again or rather in verse um, eight look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward from that place i have been instructed by the servant of god our pastor to draw our mind to the injunction that was given in that place saying ensure that you do not lose those things that have been wrought in you so the topic for this message is losing those things which god has wrought in your life losing those things which god has wrought in your life apostle paul said i'm uh, sorry apostle john said in that verse 8 look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward because he knew there were things that the lord had used him and the rest of the ministers the rest of the apostles to 
people in the lives of the people he was writing to and now now he was judging them to ensure that those things that the lord has used them to work out in them they do not lose it meaning that they also can be lost so this time in which we live in history this particular time that we are existing both in history and in the divine arrangement of God, in the divine calendar of God, is a time for losing what one has. This present time is a time for losing what one has. And it is something we are witnessing on daily basis. People are losing what they have. People are losing the things that distinguish them. And it is quite in sync with the calendar of God for the present time. You read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 6. The Bible talks about a time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Now is hardly a time to get. It is hardly a time to keep. Rather, it is a time to lose. It is a time to cast away. And if care is not taken, that which you also have right now, instead of consolidating on it, gathering more and improving, if care is not taken, you lose it. And if you also will tell yourself the truth about yourself now, and you look back properly, you will identify not quite a few things that you used to have before, which you used to cherish, which when you remember that you had then you were happy. And they really made you a better person, both in the sight of God and in the sight of men. But right now you will be searching diligently for them in your life. You cannot find them. You have lost them. You have cast them away. So, do not wish this message away. Do not parry it to the person by your side. Don't begin to say, it appears he's talking about the other person. Tonight, I am talking about you. I mean you that are hearing me now. It is about you losing the things that the Lord has wrought in you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 to verse 13. Matthew 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be served. This is the time of falling away, and surely many things are falling away from our personal lives and from what the church used to be. As Jesus Christ, who had risen from the dead, in the letter to the churches, as we see in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, in chapter 3 verse 11, he warns the church, and you are that church that he is warning today, to be very, very careful, to be very diligent, he says in verse 11 of chapter 3, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fat which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Even though Jesus has given this injunction, people in the church keep losing and losing what they already had instead of getting more. People, we are already bringing in damnable heresies and in the process denying the Lord. In this period of time, it's a period when people are importing questionable doctrines which the Bible describes as damnable heresies. They are being brought into the church and people are in the church, answering members of the church, children of God, born again Christians, but in their very deed and in their very conviction, they are denying the Lord. 
a warning against this time had already been given by Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2, from verse 1 through to verse 6. But there are, we are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with fain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them into an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. He said, Sodom and Gomorrah became a reference point, became an example to those who will allow the things that the Lord had wrought in them, who will lose them, who will allow them to fall away. So if you are wondering, that Christian quality, that Christian virtue that I used to have, and you know you used to have it, the fruit of the spirit that you used to have, that you now you don't have again, the consciousness of the righteousness of God, the consciousness of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the consciousness of the fact that you have been called out of the world and be brought and planted into the house of God as a member of the kingdom of God and therefore your life should be different and right now the consciousness is no more there and you know you have lost it. The Bible is telling you tonight that if you are wondering what should be the fate of a people who allow what the Lord has wrought in them to fall away that those people should look at Sodom and Gomorrah what we think became of them because it said they have become an example unto us in the present day so there is a losing of things which have been built into our lives as it happened to the wife of Lord was the wife of Lord served yes at a point when the angel was excusing the family of Lord from Sodom and Gomorrah that was due for an imminent destruction was that woman qualified to go to heaven? Yes. If she was not qualified, she wouldn't have been brought out of that city. But as she allowed what had been wrought inside of her to fall away as she lost it, she also lost that salvation that came into her life with those things. As she looked back, she became a pillar of salt in Genesis chapter 20, uh, chapter 19, verse 26. Genesis 19, 26. In verse 26, but his wife, talking about Lot, looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And then, in the present day, the Holy Spirit is telling you, telling me in Luke chapter 17, verse 32, remember Lord's wife. So, we are going to consider three things in this message. And as the Lord helps me, I'm going to be very brief. Number one, we will see those things we are losing both as individuals and as a church. Number two, we will see what we are losing those things to because if we are losing these qualities, if we are losing these values, somebody or something is gaining them. What are we losing these things to? And finally, we will see number three, we will see how we can recover what we have lost again. Let's go straight to point number one the things that we are losing
as individuals and as a church. The fruit of the Spirit that make for sound character and Christianity and the gifts of the Spirit that make for exploit in the faith are being lost. We are losing our character as Christians. There are qualities that define us. There are qualities that distinguish us from the rest of the crowd. There are things that make the difference in our lives. These are the qualities that made us Christians. That if they had not been there in the first place, we wouldn't say we are believers. We wouldn't say we are delivered. We wouldn't say we are born again. We wouldn't say we are children of God. We wouldn't say that we have received the life of Christ. And quite unfortunately, it is these virtues, it is these values, it is these very things that we are losing. The fruit of the Spirit that make for sound Christian character, the things that the Spirit of God is working out in us, that separate us from the people who have not believed, that separate us from the people who are not Christians, those things are the things we are losing. Our consecration, our Christian faith, our faithfulness, our commitment, our love for God, our love for the things of God, our love for the word of God, our love for righteousness, our holiness, our purity. These are the things we have lost and are still losing. We are losing our prayer life. We are losing the consciousness of the judgment of God. We are losing the consciousness of heaven and hell. We are losing the fact that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. These are the things that we used to have before. We knew we had them. There was a very strong conviction in us. Our conscience was very, very clear. That time, if anybody asked you, if you die now, where would you go? You wouldn't think twice, because right inside your heart, you knew you were born again, you knew you had been saved, you knew your sins had been forgiven, and you knew that if you died, you would go to heaven. And you were very, very glad you were going to heaven. You were holding the things of the world with a very loose hand, because you knew that the world is not your home. You are a pilgrim, you are on transit. But right now it would appear that the world has become your permanent home. Even though you see people passing on on daily basis, including the people that you knew who used to share the same seat with you in the church. Right now you can't see them again and you know you they have gone to their long home and that one of these days you will also go to your own long home. That notwithstanding, it has not affected you. Why? Because you have lost the Christian life. You have lost the Christian qualities. The things that matter to you before, they no longer matter to you. These are the things you are losing and have lost. Are you still asking me the things you have lost? Don't you know them more than I do? Don't you know the things that you used to have before? And which you used to pay, cherish? And use, which you used to remember you felt very happy? Where are they right now, sister? Brother, where are those things you used to have? Those things that made you happy in those days. If any man is in Christ, is a new creature, all things had passed away. Behold, all things had become new. And you knew you had became, become a new creature. You knew all things had passed away. You knew all things had become new. Those things that passed away have then not crept back into your life. Those new things you acquired, where are they? Those are the things you have lost. You speak about the old man with all his deeds. You could remember the deeds of the old man. You knew when they packed out of your life. But right now, the old man has come back and has built a permanent home in your life. And you are living according to the principles of the old man. You are still sister, you are still brother, you are still the pastor, you are still the same person speaking to other people, you are still the same follow-up worker, the same Christian worker that you are. And we are still calling you brother. 
the earring has not been brought back. You are still tying your head tie and all those things. But right now you know that those things that defined you, they are gone. You still want to ask me, what are you saying I have lost? Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 21 to verse 26. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 21 to the verse 26. Chapter 5, 21. Or rather, read from verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's one of the things we have lost. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So, you ask what you have lost? What about these fruits of the Spirit have been enumerated in this place? What about love? What about joy? What about peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith? Are you a good person? I mean, are you a good person? Are you a gentle person? Are you good to people around you? Are you good to your children? Are you good to your husband? Are you good to your wife? Are you good to your neighbors? People come to the church, we tell them, come down with us and God will do you good. As if we don't owe them goodness. God will do them good, probably through you. But we don't do good again. We have left the responsibility of doing good to people around us to God. We do bad things, but goodness is one of the fruits that the Spirit of God ministers to a person that has him. And you used to have it before, and while you had it, you were a good person. Where has your goodness gone? It is because people are losing Christian virtues, and this is one of the victims. Quietness of the Spirit respect for the elders in the church kindness are being replaced with the opposite no more quietness of the spirit people are boiling in a in, in a very strange rage you look at a quiet sister a quiet brother it's like a ready tinder for the fire just do a little thing and it will spark Everybody is sad, everybody is unhappy, everybody is boiling, everybody is hostile to the other person inside the church. But before it was not like that. Your best days are the times you spent in fellowship with kindred minds, with people that share the same faith and the same destiny with you. But right now you see the sister you are angry you see the brother you are angry the only thing you remember is the thing that separates you not the thing that you share in common was it like that before what happened has the bible been rev revised is the bible no longer demanding that we should dwell together in unity what is happening why are these things like this it's because we have lost christian qualities we have lost what we used to be before we are no longer the same people we used to be. Where is kindness? What of respect for elders in the church? Hmm. Respect for elders in the church, especially these our wonderful sisters. You see a young lady take on a mama in the church. You ask yourself, this one, does she have the benefit of a descent of bringing from a good woman in the home? You don't even need to be a Christian to respect elders where we are coming from. But in the church, simple respect for elderly people 
or people that are our elders is in strong supply in the church. You see a young lady speaking to somebody that is old enough to be his grandmother. You shudder, you say, Are ah, these people we are they raised up in the moon or somewhere? Even unbelieving people, these things will make them to develop gifts people when they see what is happening in the church. And yet the Bible makes it clear that the elders deserve respect in the church. Which respect do you have for the elders? I'm even talking about elders in terms of chronological age. What about those that are our elders in the faith? What about our pastors? What respect do we have for them? In this place, in a church like this. So, it is, it all evidences a great terrible loss of quality for the church. Now, we have become hostile one to another. This is true. There is so much hostility in the church. And if there is so much hostility in the church, how much more be between the people in the church and their neighbors and their colleagues in their businesses, in their business places, and in their places of work? So let me go to point number two. What are we losing them to? These Christian qualities, these virtues that we are losing, what are we losing them to? Why are we losing them? The hostile environment that the church has found is herself is making the church to become hostile. Losing the likeness of the Father and as the light. Listen. We live in a hostile world. The world is lying in wickedness. Years back as Apostle John was writing his epistle, he said, we know that we are of God and the world lieth in wickedness. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. The world is still lying in wickedness in the present day and it is becoming darker and darker in the world. But you know, Jesus knew ahead of time that the world in which he was sending us was going to be engulfed in thick darkness and he said, you are the light of the world. So the world is supposed to receive light. A Christian is supposed to impact on his environment, affect his environment, change his environment. But because of our backsliding, instead of our environment changing us, we are the ones that are being impacted by our environment and being changed by our environment. Instead of our environment taking our color and our texture, we are taking the color and the texture of the environment. What will the world give you except hostility, except wickedness, except cruelty except all the things we see today that have found their way into the church so instead of being the light of the world the darkness of the world and this shadow have been cast into the church and the church is losing its light and when i talk about the church now think about yourself first as the church have you not lost your light are you brightening that small corner where you are have you not taken the darkness from outside you, the hostility, the quarreling, the envy, the slander, the everything that defines the weakness of the wickedness of the world has managed to find its way inside of you and therefore inside of the church as well. So that is why we are where we are. But this is an aberration. Look at the injunction that Jesus Christ, look at what he said concerning the church in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 16. In verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savour, where we shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your father which is in heaven that is it we are to be the salt of the world the salt of the earth the light of the world but quite unfortunately the darkness that is coming from the world our light in its feebleness has not been able to withstand it and what has happened is that it has it appears to have quenched the light and we have taken the nature of that wicked terrible hostile environment in which we are as a church and as individuals we are losing love for god to love for the world there is no love for the neighbor and for one another but the bible still is true and it is still there in first john chapter 15 chapter 2 15 to 17 love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man if any woman if any person loves the world as it is now it means that the love of the father is not in him all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes pride of life they will pass away but notwithstanding this very timely warning by the spirit of the living god we have grabbed the world with an open arm and we are holding it tight as if the world will serve us that is why we are losing this thing to the onslaught of the world in john chapter 4 and verse 4 james chapter 4 verse 4 ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with god whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of god did you read it brethren men and brethren did you read it in your bible if you didn't read let me read it again so that you will hear ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with god whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of god if you will befriend this world and find your groove inside the world and be very comfortable in the world and the world is very comfortable with you you like the world the world likes you you welcome the world the world welcomes you you say it means that you have already counted yourself an enemy of god as it was of old so it is in the present day the lord almighty still insists that those that will be his will hold the world loosely praise the lord so what we have lost is the love for our neighbors what we have lo lost is the love for one another yet jesus christ said as of old as of now by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another look at john chapter 13 verse 34 to verse 35 john chapter 13 verse 34 a new commandment i give unto you that ye love one another as i have loved you that ye also love one another by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have love one to another the world the way that people will know that you belong to me is when you love one another when you love including the person that you are finding it difficult to love because he is a difficult person she is a difficult person she's coming from a totally complete different background from your own and his own ways may not be your own ways his background is not your own background you are still to love him and jesus christ said the litmus test for knowing whether you belong to me is when you have this unconditional love the one for another loving the people because i am commanded to love them not because they already love me and are treating me with love but i am loving them because the bible commands that i should love them do you have that kind of love for the brethren in not even some there are some people that love you you love them back 
But those that you feel that they don't love you so much, you don't love them. You don't even talk to them. You don't greet them. It doesn't matter that they are old enough to be your mother. That if you were to be coming from the same parents, you will call, be calling them auntie, or as they will call in the place, be calling them sister, you can't call them by their names. When you see them in the church, you do like this and look them eyeball to eyeball. What kind of rubbish is this in the house of God? When you were born again, was that like that? It wasn't like that. But when you should be consolidating the virtues of Christianity, that when you allow this thing to slip by, and then you are doing anyhow and causing confusion in the house of God, pastors will preach and preach and preach, and after preaching, they will come and hold private session with you, pleading with you to make peace with their brethren in the church. Because we have lost what the Lord had in his infinite mercies wrought in our lives. And we poor brethren, we are gradually losing grip of the true Christianity which Christ brought and which is about our lives and not about religion. Gradually, yes, but some people not very gradually, rather swiftly, they have completely lost everything they are just managing in the church. And if you ask them and they will tell you the truth, they will, they will tell you, I don't, I don't even know if I'm a Christian again, if I'm born again, again. They are not sure. Yet, Christianity is not about religion. It's not about belonging to a church. It's not about coming together like this. It's about living the life of Christ and having the life of Christ inside of us and the life speaking that Christ is inside of us, the hope of glory, that we have received Jesus and that you see this way, all these virtues that I have, the love that I have, the purity of heart, the cleanness of hand, the holy living and holy aspiration, the kind word that I speak, the good things that I do, they are manifesting because I have Jesus Christ, which is the epitome of goodness, living inside of me, and it is he that is manifesting all these things. That is what Christianity is all about. And whatever we now do, whether we are being consumed by the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eye or pride of life or hostility and wickedness and all the evil things that appear to be submerging the church today, if those things are the things that are manifesting in us, we are saying that what we have inside of us, even though you cannot see it, but this is the handiwork. These are the handiworks of what is inside me. Is that person the same Jesus Christ? Or some other thing has taken his place in your life. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, 12 to 13. Chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were a unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took notice of them that they had been with Jesus. They took notice of them that they had been with Jesus. Because they could see Jesus manifest, manifest in their words, manifest in their comportment, manifest in their character, manifest in their aspiration, manifest in the way they treated people within and outside the food, and they knew that suddenly, certainly, Jesus had made impact in the lives of such people. We are losing the faith of the fathers to the fanfare around us. What a pity. Look at Jude verse 3 and verse 4. Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in on our ways who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I wrote unto you that you should earnestly Contend for the faith. Seriously contend for the faith. 
diligently contend for the faith. But right now, we are denying the faith of our fathers. And this place, we are acquiring the firm faith of religion around us. Our young ones and even the old people in the church are no longer satisfied with the faith that was delivered unto the saints, even the faith of our fathers. They are not happy with the purity of the simple gospel that transformed their lives and the lives of their fathers when they received the gospel. Right now, they are going for the jangolova that is passing in the name of Christianity in the places. You see, if we do not take care, if we do not take care, and the younger people in the church, all these my wonderful brethren, and whether you are wonderful or not, you will judge yourself. But all these wonderful people, let me call because I am an ordinary human being. If you do not contend for this faith, if care is not taken, Roman Catholics will judge us because they contend for their faith. They cherish what they have. I can look back to years back when I stayed with Reverend Sisters in the class some 30, 32 years back. Those Reverend Sisters, they maintained their quietness and their sobriety. And they were happy to wear what they were wearing from this place to this place. They were glad to be different. They were very proud of their heritage. And this made the people to respect them. Even then I knew the, I knew the Bible. I was born again. But I saw how these people comported themselves. Go and see a reverend sister yesterday. She's still looking like that. Do you see them? Have they changed? But then they are telling us in this place that this our dressing, this way we are doing. Have those women complained? Do you know they are denied marriage? Do you know they don't build houses? Listen, my cousin is a reverend sister. I don't know when I saw her last. And I don't know how many times. Once in a year, she comes back from France, where she is. She comes to see the people, and she goes back once in a year. At times, she might not come. My cousin is a reverend father. I, I can say that since he became a reverend father many, many years back, I've only seen him once or twice. They are holding to what they have. And if you see how people revere them and respect them, and then the respect even transcend to their parents and their families. Is that not so? Well, yeah, you go and go sit to your pastor there by the road, you will lay him. Even if he's going to the pulpit and tell you, say he's a wicked man. What kind of thing is this? Is it Christianity? Is that the way we began? So, what is wrong? It is simply because we have lost it. Let's tell ourselves the home truth. We have lost it. And if we do not acknowledge that we have lost it, we keep losing and losing and losing. But if we acknowledge that something is wrong, we can cry out this night. We can ask the Lord to have mercy upon us. Perchance he might have mercy upon us and deliver us. But if you say, I am okay. Everything is well with me. I feel all right. I don't need anything. Then you go empty-handed. And then enough will not be enough. Because you will still lose them all. So if you want to be enough, if, if you want enough to be enough today, in all this ramification, you have to go and look into your life and look at the things that have crept into your life that don't belong and deal with them. When you deal with them, then you have made a proper foundation for enough to be enough. Praise the Lord. So we are losing the faith of our fathers to firm faith. We are losing the lesson. Do you know there are people in this church, and I believe it very strongly, that they don't believe that sexual sin is sin. Now, when you pray, when you preach against fornication, adultery, and loss, they think you are, you are wasting your time, you are not preaching to them. These young people, you should mind yourself. By the way they carry on, you know they don't believe it. 
They think you are just wasting your time and they, they go ahead. This, this age of social media, we see you now, how you will pose. My dear, we see you are there. We saw them, in, we see them in Facebook. Those are theirs. I don't know where they learned this one. Is it in this church or elsewhere? Is that what they do in the places? You, what you have received, what you have learned, you just throw it away. You throw it to the dogs as if it doesn't matter. And we are talking about faith of the fathers. So, this is a very serious aberration. And if we cry out this morning, the Lord will have mercy upon us. We are losing the, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are losing the, the very truth that one becomes a Christian, all things pass away, all things become new. We are losing the grace. Apostle Paul writing to Titus in chapter 2, verse 11, he said, The grace of God brings salvation. That is the first thing that grace does. It brings salvation. And salvation is a, it is a noun that is formed from the verb serve. To serve is to deliver. So if you are saved, you have been delivered. Salvation means you are saved from sin. You are saved from the stranglehold of sin. You are saved from the power of sin. You are saved from the power of Satan. You are saved from the power of the devil and the world. They don't hold a grip over your life and dictate for you what you should be and what you should do. When you receive grace, you receive salvation. And he said, grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And when grace comes, that it teaches people who have received it to deny, number one, ungodliness. Number two, worldly lust. And after teaching them to deny ungodliness and worldly loss, what next does it do? It teaches us to do what? To live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, not in the next world. But today we say we are Christian, we have received grace, we are not living soberly, we are not living righteously, we are not living godly, we have not denied ungodliness, we have not denied worldly loss. Yet we are saying we are product of grace. Thank God for his grace. What kind of grace is this? This kind of grace that has not delivered you from worldly loss. This kind of grace that has not delivered you from godliness. is a questionable doubtful kind of grace. It is not the grace of God. And if right now there is no more sobriety, no more godliness, no more righteousness, and you are living You've not been delivered from loss and all the things that are associated with it. You probably received grace before. And chances are that you no longer have that grace. Look for it where you dropped it. You need it. You need it here. You are going to need it over there. Look for where you dropped that grace that helped you in those days to deny ungodliness. Look for where you dropped that grace that helped you in those days to deny worldly loss. In all the various ways it manifests itself. Look for that grace that helped you in that day to comport yourself as a Christian woman, as a Christian man. Even in the face of provocation, look for it. If right now the things you are able to overcome, you no longer overcome them, it means that the grace is no longer there. You need that grace, you can get it back this evening. Praise the Lord. So, we are losing the grace that brings us salvation. We have lost the gospel that shows the boundary between the world and the church and the clean and the unclean. We have lost this gospel. We speak about gospel, but the time you receive the gospel, the gospel told you the church is not the world. The world is not in the, the world is not the church. The church is different from the world. The word that is translated church, ecclesia means called out, meaning that we are called out from the world, from the system of the world, from its value system, from its principles, from its aspirations, from its ambitions, from the things it loved. 
to unlock to the to the kingdom of God, the invisible kingdom of God, ecclesia, you have been called out. Meaning that a church is not the word. Neither is the word the church. But right today, you have grabbed the word with both your hands. And you are holding tight to the word. And you say you are in the church. Can anything be far from the truth? Or further from the truth? So that gospel that told us that this is where the church begins. And exactly where the word ends. We have thrown away that gospel and said... You can struggle between the world and the church. You can have one leg in the world and the other leg in the church and be walking. That is what is happening today. So, we <clears throat> dreams ha ha have taken the place of the undiluted word of God. The word of God has been so mixed and diluted that it has no more. It is no more sharper than any two-edged sword. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice came, which came from heaven we had. When we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereon to ye do well, that ye take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the dead down and the dead star arise in your heart. You see, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Talking about the primacy of the word of God. Talking about the inerrancy of the word of God. You say, even though we saw these things with our physical eyes. When we were with Jesus in the mountain. This word of God is a more sure word of prophecy. But we are dealing with a people that have so mixed the word, diluted the word, even though the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than into a sword, the word it appears today to be very, very weak and inefficient and cannot do anything, cannot deliver from sin, cannot deliver from the besetting sin that is besetting the lives of the people, cannot deliver from wickedness, cannot deliver from lying, cannot deliver from stealing, cannot deliver from dishonesty, cannot deliver from quarreling, and this anger, and unforgiving spirit, and lust, and all manner of sin. The word of God is no longer sharper than two-edged sword. Why? Because it has been diluted. Why? Because it has been corrupted. The truth has been lost to storytelling, and comic and humorous mesmerization of the people the truth of the word of god that you will hear the word of god you become sober that's the first thing i learned when i came to watch man that when you hear the word of god there is no way you will hear the word of god it will make you sober but right now the word of god even because of the way we are handling it and because of the way we have taken it to be it doesn't make people sober again it is now if you want to sleep it is like a sleeping pill the moment the word of God begins to come, the sleep that has refused to come will begin to come. Those that are writing prayer requests, that are suffering from insomnia, they have not been sleeping, that the church should help them to sleep. But watch them when the word of God comes, they sleep off. And may have three courses of dream before you finish a one hour preaching. Because the word of God is no longer seen as the word of God. It is a mark of backsliding. That's the respect that we have lost. And we must, we must cry out tonight and say, God, things should not remain this way. And the other person that uh, they say made a lot of uh, impact somewhere in Eastern Europe, have a very big church. And right now, he, in order to, uh, to conquer Nigeria too, he is now abusing the big pastors in the land, the people we respect, the people we honor, the people that the Bible says should be treated with double honor. This young man comes and, you know, he abuses them. 
he makes very snide remarks about them and people are hailing them go ahead You know, the Bible says that when the angel disputed with Satan over the body of Moses, eh? you see what the Bible said? That he didn't, the angel didn't bring a, a railing accusation. Michael didn't bring a railing accusation against Satan. Even though Satan was living in disobedience, he only said, the Lord rebuke you. He still respected that Satan that was his superior before he was cast down. But here, people are taking pleasure in abusing people and riding a rough shot of people that the Bible says should be worthy of double honor. When you see such people, pity them if perchance God may have mercy on them and deliver them. And don't follow them. If you want to save your head, praise the Lord. Let me conclude by looking at how we can recover the things we have lost. Let us look at Luke chapter 15, verse 17. Luke chapter 15, let me read from verse 17. When he came to himself, talking about the prodigal son, he said, How many higher servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and we say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son, and make me as one of thy higher servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is li alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his, and they began to be merry in verse 27. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come. And thy father had killed the fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. Let's stop there. This man, after he had rebelled, lost uh, what he used to enjoy because he disobeyed the father, walked in the imagination of his own heart, when he began to suffer the consequences of his rebellion, he now decided to retrace his step. He said, I will go back to my father. I will own up before him. I will tell him I made a mistake. I will tell him I am worthy of whatever punishment that I shouldn't even be called his son. I will ask him to forgive me. I will do everything within, my, um, within me to make sure he forgave me. I will humble myself. I will tell him I have sinned against him and against heaven. He didn't stop there. He went ahead and did according to what he said he would do. And as he did it, the father received him. So then, even Mary and Joseph, if you recall, when they went with Jesus to that feast in uh, Jerusalem, and on their way back, they lost Jesus Christ, and not being aware that they had already lost him, they went into three days' journey without Christ. When they now discovered that Christ was no longer there, what did they do? Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year, the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in their company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their king's foes and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. 
And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Let's stop there. They thought Jesus was in their company. Just as we probably in presumption think everything is well with us, but right now, our attention has been drawn to some of those qualities that made us Christians, which we do not have, and the conscience is telling us now that chances are that we need to come clear, come clean rather, and start on a clean slate with the Lord and make a break with this life of laws. As Mary and Joseph did that day, they retraced their step and found Jesus where they had lost him. So tonight, the Lord is challenging you, retrace your step, go back to Bethel, go to the place where you lost those Christian virtues, go to the place where you lost your concentration, where you lost your purity, your righteousness, your sobriety, your, your right aspiration, your humility, your prayerfulness, your commitment, your consecration. Go back like the prodigal son and tell the Lord, these are the things I have lost. I am sorry about it. Please, I want to get them back. Have mercy upon me. I've been frivolous. I've been careless. But right now, I want you to restore unto me all these things that the locusts and palm worms and caterpillars have stolen from me. Give them back to me. If you ask the Lord in sincerity, the Lord will return them to you. Remember in Jeremiah 29, it said, verse 13, You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. If you pray with all your heart tonight, the Lord will have mercy on you. Praise the Lord. So Mary and Joseph had to search with all their heart and soul and strength. We have to go back and search for the lost things. We have to light in a candle, sweep the entire house, turn it upside down, seek for those things diligently. Do some introspection now as we begin to pray. Look at the qualities. Look at the experiences you used to have that you don't have again. Look at the inner witnessing of the Spirit of God. Before the Spirit of God used to speak to you, but right now you are depending on yourself and you think everything is okay. Everything is not okay. But the good news is that you can get those things back. The prodigal son realized that he had lost something. Nobody has ever been recovered from sin that did not realize his situation. Realize your situation, pastor, worker, every person, including me, whatever you are, a new person. Listen, I've been talking to people that are born again, who have been saved, who have experienced the new birth. What about those who are not born again, who have not known Jesus Christ? What do you think about yourself? Is it not high time you went to Jesus and made peace with him? Is it not about time you cried out and said, Look, Lord, save me or I die. Deliver me. I want to know you. So, wherever, whatever things you have lost can be retrieved this night. Do you believe you can retrieve them? Do you think you can retrieve them? Are you serious about that? Okay, since you say yes, the Lord has heard you. Now you want to pray to the Lord and begin to identify those things you have lost and in repentance you are going to tell the Lord I want to get them back I want to get them back I want to recover my consecration I want to recover my purity I want to recover the consciousness of sin and consciousness of eternity and the judgment of God my purity, my righteousness the victory I used to have over sin and the world I want to have everything back I want to withhold nothing and I don't want you to withhold anything back from me. Begin to pray unto the Lord now. You are not born again. You have an opportunity. You can be born again this night. You can begin with the Lord. You can become a member of the family of God. You can know the Lord. The Lord can also know you. Right now, he may have known you as a disobedient person, as a sinner. But tonight, the Lord can show you his mercy. The Lord can have compassion on you. The Lord can recover you. Righteous Father in heaven, I remember the heights from which we have fallen, Lord. We have been living in the past, in the, in the waning glow of what we used to be with you, Lord. The gentle voice of the Spirit we used to hear. Those things that gave us pleasure and assurance that when we are going to heaven, Lord, we are looking for them. We cannot find them. 
We look for righteousness. It looks to be something that is impossible to have. Purity appears to be, Lord, like a kindergarten feather. Holiness everlasting father appear to be appears to be far fetched from us. We have backslid in love. We are not better than the world. No longer we've not been able to impact on the world. We have presented a very ugly face of Christ to the world, Lord. And because we have been so weak, Lord, the Lord the, the world has find it so easy, Lord, to defeat us. Father in heaven, you began and you have to conclude what you have begun. Here I am before you, Lord. On the altar I lay myself afresh this night. I am asking you, Lord, pour out your mercy upon the church. Recover your people again, I pray you, Lord. For the work has not been completed. And none of us is yet a finished work. In the factory line of the Lord, release your mercy again. Release your grace again. Revive your works again in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make no Lord. And in your work, remember mercy. Eternal God in heaven, how can we lose all these qualities and we still claim to be members of the church when, as a matter of fact, the thing that separated us from the world, we have lost them. Eternal Father in heaven, have mercy. I can only ask for your mercy. I can only ask for your mercy. I can only ask for your mercy, great Father. I ask for your mercy for myself. I ask for your mercy for the church. I ask for your mercy for the brethren. I ask for your mercy for the old timer. I ask for your mercy for the new timer. As we consecrate ourselves our first unto you, I pray you, dear Lord God in heaven, let nothing remain that will not be recovered again, even this night, according to the promise that you have made unto us, that if we seek, we find, we seek, we find, we ask, we receive, and we knock, and the doors are opened unto us. But as we seek this night, I pray we will find. As we ask this night, I pray we will receive. Receive forgiveness, receive newness of life, receive empowerment, receive refreshing, coming from the presence of the Lord. Receive revival again, receive renewal again, receive inner purity again, receive sanctification again, receive the gift and the fruits of the Spirit of, of God again, receive the ability to walk worthy of you, unto all pleasing, to be fruitful in every good work, to increase in the knowledge of God. We receive them as we ask, grandfather in heaven. We receive them as the prodigal son walked out there and say, I go to my father. So do we come to you this day and I ask you, Father, that in pity and in mercy, you will receive us. For if that man was able to receive those, that young man, ah, you also will be able to receive us today as we come unto you. Because you are much more righteous than the father of the prodigal son. And I pray you, blessed father, you will have pity, you will have mercy. As many as are confessing, Lord, I pray you will hear and you will forgive. Because it is written, he that confesseth his sin and forsake them shall have mercy. This is a time of mercy. This is a time of refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Father, we receive it, and it shall be with us, Lord. And all the things that have overcome us, we will overcome them according to your promise in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I want to read in the book of Isaiah chapter 61, chapter 6. Quietness, please pay attention. It's time to sort out something in our life. It's a very serious, critical moment. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I also I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his throne filled the temple. Above he stood the seraphims. Each one has six wings. With when he covered his face, with when he covered his face, and with when he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with a tongue from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Somebody has been ministering, walking, but he has lost the consciousness. He has lost clean lips. He has lost sanctification. And he was pronouncing woe to the people he was ministering to. And God decided to show mercy upon him. And suddenly he had a revelation of God. Where the whole place was filled with the glory, the, uh, the, the seraphim, the cherubims worshiping and singing holy songs unto God. And then he, he now discovered that I'm not qualified to minister to this holy God because I have unclean lips. How is he with us? And how are we overcoming the issue of lack of sanctification? Unclean lips. The unpurged mouth, unpurged heart, ministry with wickedness, serving with wickedness in our hearts as a watchman. I will read another one of another man of God who was very, very sincere. He ran into a terrible situation, the storm, and then God turned away from him. And then he cried unto God and said, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That was. David in the Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51, I read from verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, brought out my transgressions. Watch me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Watch me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy faith from my sins and blot out all my trans iniquities, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing around of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest uh, sacri not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the wall of Jerusalem. There shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. With burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then shall they offer bullocks upon thy altar. Look up. Look up. No distraction. This is a very serious issue, brethren. This man I'm talking about here is the king of the people. And you know how powerful, how exalted kings are. But he was rebuked by a, a, a prophet. Nathan came and said, this is what you have done. 
He didn't say catch him and kill him. He had no respect for me. And they brought to fall all the iniquity and what transpired between him and the wife of Uliah and all the killings and all the immorality and everything. He was broken down. And the note he had lost the joy of salvation. A man after God had, but he was floating without direction. And he needed to be recovered. Are you exalted in office in the church? Leave office. We are talking something serious right now. Are you a woman leader, pastor, wife that got into rebellion? Now you needed to do something this night. Forget about title. Forget about nomenclature. You are just coming. Don't say it's a new convert. They are talking to them. I'm talking to you. Now it is time to take a decision. Don't even look at your neighbor. Have you lost your salvation? Have you been saved before? Have you backslidden? You know yourself. Don't you know yourself? How that Christ was in you originally. Lest you be a reprobate. You know yourself. You can't tell yourself a lie. This is truth. Now there is no time. I want us to begin to come to God. This is why we are here. If enough must be enough, we must do something. We must shut the gate against the devil. All those places where the devil is avenging us, we must close it down so that uh, we enjoy a new life. And this is what we want to do now. Are you there? Don't waste time. Just come out. We want to pray. Just a little thing, a little movement, a short walk. God will do now. And your life will be renewed afresh. Quickly, there is no time to waste. You can come up from the choir. You can come up from anywhere you are. Don't say they will remove me from choir if I come out. Not lie. Nobody will remove you. It is even now you are qualified to be in the choir. When you come out and confess yourself, say, God, look at the situation of my life. I cannot hide anymore. Where am I hiding? I can't hide it from God. Though I can hide it from human beings, they may not know. But I cannot hide it from God. And God is watching a broken and a contract heart, God will not forsake. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. You have uh, in attempt to protect your ministry, you have even committed abortion. So that they not say, ah, he has committed abortion. You covered it up and you are ministering. You are going into immorality and you covered it up and you are ministering. Now I want to let you know that this opportunity, God is not looking for a person to kill. We want to do that. He's seen up. Hasting up. Don't need by the back of the person in front of you. No problem. God has seen you. You have made a movement already. And he will reach out to you wherever you are. We are waiting for you from up here. Quickly. Thank you, Lord. I hope you are talking to God now. You are started talking to God. God have mercy upon me according to their loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy mercies, tender mercy brought out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. I recognize my sins. They are ever before my presence. I sin against you. I've done the thing that I'm not supposed to do. You are justified when you punish me. I am qualified for the punishment you have given me. But now I'm kneeling before God who has the power to, to cleanse. Whose tender mercy has no boundary. Cry unto me. He answers. He projects. Thank you, my Father. I want to appreciate you. Thank you, excellent God on heaven and earth. The eight millennials God of the watchman the searcher of the hearts of men. I want to appreciate you for the souls of men that are here. Hallelujah. Amen. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. That you know you are going too far. There is opportunity for you. I know that the moment you step out to this place, God have already know what you are saying. So I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence again over the period 
I've been serving with guilt in my heart. I've tried severally to cover off my iniquities with service. The more I try to cover up, the more my nakedness is exposed. I am, have no joy anymore. I don't even see my time again. But this moment, oh God, I kneel before your presence. I know you are merciful, God. You say, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, I have come unto you now. I have weight upon my life. Lord, please help me. Take it away from me. And give me rest. In the name of Jesus. I thank you because you have answered my prayer. I have not known you before. Please forgive all my sins. Take my name away from the book of death. I write my name in the book of life. Grant me inheritance. Among them that are, are sanctified. Thank you because I know you've answered my prayer. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Praise your Father. I want to thank you for this wonderful people of God. I thank you because they are here to your calling. Lord, and I know you are happy that they came. So that you will purge their sins away and wash them clean. That they might be restored into the place of grace. At that point, heaven will begin to fight their cause again. And all the things that he touched have lavaged their lives will now be kept at hold and taken away. Thank you because, Lord, evil shall no longer thrive. Lord, a new thing will begin now. I want to thank you because you have purged our sins now. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the assurance of salvation again. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for everything you have done. Lord, receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray at the return, let that consciousness remain. And they say, I sin no more. Lord, let them not return to sin. Let them remain in your presence continuously serving the Lord in righteousness and true holiness all the days of their lives in Jesus' name. Lord, I that the blessings of God will come upon them tonight. Let them return with packages of blessings in Jesus' name. Joy of salvation is restored. Assurance of salvation is restored. Guilt is taken away. Shame is taken away. Restoration is perfected. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for answer to prayers. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Every dawn, every call.